Good morning. Uh, my name's Malcolm. Great to uh, be here this morning to speak to you. Just uh, by way of explanation, my left knee has gone a little bit dodgy, so um, I'm, I'm going to sit today so that I don't have to put too much weight on my left knee, uh, which hopefully I can get sorted out through this week. Um, but, and thank you for your prayers, those of you who prayed for me already. Um, so some of the gospel communities have been uh, looking at a course called The Prayers of Many, which is written by Mike Betts, who's one of the leaders of Relational Mission. And we're in this period of Lent where we're focusing on prayer and we're just wanting to emphasize prayer in different ways. And the course looks at uh, prayers uh, as we gather together, the corporate prayer, really. Um, and so we've been working through the chapters in some of the groups. And today we're going to look at uh, chapter four, which is entitled Fire, um, because a small spark can have a big impact. Um, and then next week, we'll be looking again at uh, one of the other chapters as well. So when you get a forest fire, it generally uh, just starts with something very, very small and can then spread and spread and spread. And we've all seen the, the pictures on TV, uh, forest fires in California or in Australia, uh, just enormous devastation. And so the illustration is, is a kind of one which sort of feels a bit uh, destructive, but in his book, Mike wants to say that this illustration can be flipped around um, so that we think about it in a positive way. Um, because f as fire spreads um, in, a, in, in a very rapid way uh, through forests, uh, when it comes to prayer, we can actually uh, help one another and spark one another in our praying. Uh, when you pray by yourself, it can be quite hard work, but when you're in a group, even if you're not feeling that up for prayer in a prayer meeting, uh, somebody else's passion or something that's said will just begin to spark a bit more. And so that's the kind of uh, illustration he's using in his uh, book. Um, so sometimes he says you have to persevere in prayer. You get to a prayer meeting, it might be early in the morning, but gradually as you persevere, this uh, fire will take hold, this spiritual fire will take hold and begin to spread through the room. So Mike in his uh, course, a very creative, lots of uh, creative ideas, um, not necessarily entirely practical for those of us living in a North London flat, because this week he suggests that you should watch the prayer tip video, then, as a group, go outside and make a fire, praying as you do, <laughs> building your prayer time as you would build a fire. Now, given how many of you got gardens? I mean, you know, it's a, it, there's a limited number of gardens among us. Some of you got balconies, so probably putting a balcony, you know, a fire on a balcony is not a brilliant idea. Uh, if you have got a garden, it might not be a very big garden. I, I remember Luke Ellis, who used to be uh, an elder in this church. He was, he's great, Luke. He's now an elder in another church, another relational mission church locally. He loves fire pits. And um, we, we were meeting together as elders back when we were in lockdown. And there was a time when we could just um, be outside a group of up to six people in a garden, if you remember those days. And so we arrived at uh, Luke's house house, we all walked through the house, which wasn't, wasn't strictly legal, but we had to walk through the house to get to the garden. And uh, I think there were four or five of us there, and Luke had created this fire pit. And uh, he was so enthusiastic about lobbing this wood on. It was, it was the middle of winter. We're in our coats. We've got our gloves on, our hats. We're, we're shivering around this fire pit. And Luke's getting closer and closer to the fire pit. I thought he was gonna, his hair was going to start catching light uh, because he was just edging so, so close to it. Um, but of course, it wasn't the best environment to have a, an elders meeting. We were getting smoky. There was uh, smoke going into our eyes and stinging, and uh, you were just trying to concentrate on what we we're talking about. And, and then I went home went and had a shower straight away. Um, and then my coat smelled of, of smoke for about 10 days or two weeks after that. Just kept smelling of smoke. Uh, personally banned Luke from doing any fire pit elders meetings after that. Uh, he absolutely loved it. Um, so building a fire in London is also slightly dodgy because it's actually illegal to have um, smoke in London. It's supposed to be a smokeless zone, apparently. Uh, I didn't realize that until after we'd done the fire pit. Um, but if you burn wood or coal and you create loads of smoke, you're not supposed to do that. I'm sure Mike Betts isn't encouraging London believers to break the law, but um, you might want to think carefully about that kind of activity. 
The imagery of fire, of course, is uh, something which is used throughout the, the Bible, but in the New Testament, uh, in Matthew 3 and Luke 3, uh, John the Baptist talks about fire. He says, I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I'm not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And uh, that prediction or that prophecy was fulfilled in Acts chapter 2. So we're going to read Acts chapter 2, verses 1 to 4. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each of one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So short reading, but on that day, the day of Pentecost, these tongues of fire were seen to descend and rest on the heads of the disciples in that upper room. So this fire imagery in Acts chapter 2 isn't about destruction and devastation, but it's rather about purification. One Bible commentator says this, the idea behind the picture of fire is usually of purification, as a refiner uses fire to make pure gold, or fire can burn away what is temporary, leaving only what will last. You'll re recall there are occasions, many occasions in the Old Testament when God sent down fire from heaven to burn up a sacrifice. Uh, so for example, Elijah you remember that time when he was uh, in this confrontation with the prophets of Baal? And he says, look, let's, let's have this comp competition. Let's see who's, whose God is the true God. And uh, they spend all day. They, built, they build the altar. They have the sacrifices on it. Uh, the prophets of Baal sort of uh, worship their gods and cut themselves and do all sorts of chanting. But no fire comes down. And Elijah says, look, you know, the true God is going to send fire. And at the end of the day, he says, let's just dig some trenches around this, this uh, sacrifice. Let's put water all over it. And then he calls on God to send fire. And fire comes straight down and uh, licks up the water and uh, burns up absolutely everything. Uh, 1 Kings 18.38. And here in Acts chapter 2, the tongues of fire descended not on burnt sacrifices, but on living sacrifices. These people were to carry the gospel to many, many people. These people were commissioned with a special uh, message to proclaim to the ends of the earth, uh, to Jerusalem, to J Judea and Samaria and the ends of the earth. So what was this amazing good news message that they were, they were to pro proclaim? They had just witnessed the most remarkable miracle that the world had ever seen or experienced, this person that had died on the cross, Jesus, had now risen to life. They just lived through that. Uh, a man had died, a man had come back to life. In her book, Living His Story, Hannah Steele writes, the gospel is good news about an event that actually happened. It is not merely a record of spiritual teaching or rules for life. To announce that the final enemy, death, has been defeated and that there is one who has risen from the grave is not a matter purely of personal piety, but is of public importance. The resurrection of Jesus is of such earth-shattering consequence that it cannot possibly be irrelevant. These people had seen Jesus, they'd walked with Jesus, they'd been with him, they saw him crucified on a cross, and then on the third day he rose again. What an extraordinary story it was. And they had to proclaim it, but they were frightened people, and they needed the power of the Holy Spirit to enable them and embolden them to proclaim this good news story. And so the Spirit comes on them in Acts chapter 2, and they start this proclamation about who Jesus was. They fulfill the commission to tell the world. Now, I don't know everybody here. I don't know everybody in the room, but I just uh, 
want to say, if you have never actively put your faith in Jesus, if you know you haven't yet really followed him and made him Lord of your life, I just want to encourage you to do that, to really seriously think about doing that. I know many of us have, and God has changed our lives, totally transformed our lives. He's promised us forgiveness of sin. He's promised us eternal life. And you just know, because of the way that God sends the power of the Spirit upon you, that that promise will be fulfilled. Today is the day of salvation. And so I just want to encourage you, if you haven't already made that step of faith, to do that. Going back to his book, The Prayers of Many book, uh, Mike argues that the baptism with the Holy Spirit has a real impact on our ability to pray effectively. Uh, you can see in the, in the book of Acts the way that the disciples pray when they gather together. and They, they have some powerful prayer meetings. Their expectations are very high. Their, their faith levels are very high. And they pray some very powerful prayers. And it makes a lot of sense that we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit, not just to share our faith and witness with other people, but also to know how to pray and to pray in, effectively. So I suppose my uh, next application in this sermon is to ask whether you've been filled or baptized with the Holy Spirit. Um, Again, if you haven't, if you've believed in Jesus, but you haven't yet experienced the power of the Holy Spirit, I want to encourage you to really seek that. Uh, Peter said on that day of Pentecost, you know, repent and be baptized in water and the power of the Holy Spirit will come upon you. So it's something we should expect. The promise, he says, is for you and for your children and for your children's children and all generations. And we are, we're under that promise. We can be part of that. Uh, I want to share a little bit about my own story later on, uh, about how I got filled with the Holy Spirit for the very first time many years ago. Uh, but I'll come back to that later on. We are now going to just carry on following Mike's uh, uh, book and the way he goes through his chapter about fire and this analogy of fire, uh, comparing that to prayer and needing that a sense of the spark of God to get our prayer meetings going. And he says when you're making a fire, a good fire needs fuel, it needs planning, it needs patience, it needs a bit of space to heat up and uh, time to build momentum. And so he takes this analogy of fire to talk about prayer meetings. They need fuel. Uh, When we gather to pray on Tuesday mornings, we regularly start with uh, a Bible passage or some Bible verses, or maybe encourage people to share some things that they feel uh, God's really spoken to them about through the the Scriptures. And it's a good way of just um, getting some fuel to get the fire going. It's good to have testimonies as well. Sometimes people have got answers to prayer to share, and and those things really encourage prayer as well. So you need fuel. You need some sort of uh, way of starting the prayer meeting. So if you're ever leading a prayer meeting, think about the fuel you need to get started. And they need planning. If you're going to light a fire, you need to think about the best location. Uh, You need some wood. You need something to burn. You need to work out where you're going to start the fire. Uh, You're going to need some matches or a magnifying glass and some strong sunshine or two sticks to rub together. You need to start this thing somehow. Uh, People that are leading prayer meetings need to give good boundaries uh, for prayer so that it doesn't kind of get out of control. A fire might get out of control. Uh, You want to light a fire in a fire pit or in some sort of metal container. You don't want to light a fire in the middle of your carpet in the lounge. You you want something which contains it. And uh, uh, if you're leading a prayer meeting, you need to be giving it some boundaries. So you need a loose agenda of some sort. Um, I don't think you want to have a, a strong fixed agenda. I think you just want to be open to what God's saying. But you do need to be aware of the content you want to bring, the timing and the, the pace and the flow. It, it, prayer meetings need good leadership. They need some leadership. Um, I think I remember back to prayer meetings I used to uh, lead when I was uh, leading the church in Wimbledon. And uh, we would have a loose agenda, so the the elders would know roughly which way I wanted to go in the prayer time. But uh, quite often that would get interrupted. I remember one prayer meeting where we're just working through, praying about different things, but we also waited on God for a little while, and somebody uh, who'd got a great track record in prophecy, she said, I I think we just need to pray for the elders uh, and uh, 
we felt, okay, that would be good. So it wasn't in, on my agenda at all. But So they gathered around us, about three, of, three or four of us as elders in the room, they gathered around us and... Uh, you know, God really began to meet with us, and it wasn't long before we were, uh, you know, feeling the, the power of God upon us. We all ended up falling down on the floor. Uh, the prayer meeting took a very different direction. It, sort of my agenda went out the window at that point. But it was just that willingness to wait on God and see what God might say. And then you need patience to get a fire going. Uh, I think I'm probably the world's worst barbecuer. Um, Kathy will tell you I have a terrible track record on trying to light and start barbecues. Uh, we haven't done one for many years uh, because of that. Uh, but I do remember that uh, we had some friends around uh, years ago when we lived in Wimbledon. And um, we hadn't, I don't think we'd seen these friends for a long time. So we wanted to make a nice afternoon. And our children were quite young and they're playing in the garden. And so I would light this, this barbecue and get it going. And uh, I lit it and it, it took ages to get this thing going. And uh, we, you know, every time we sort of got, got the food out and thought, is it ready yet? It wasn't really quite ready. Uh, it was too, many, too much flame or whatever. It was, just wasn't the right heat. Um, and it took so long and so long. In the end, Kathy said, I'm just going to take the food and cook it in the oven. You know, there's no point in waiting for this. So she cooked it in the oven. Uh, it all came out. It was really lovely. We all sat down and ate this barbecue. Uh, and the, the barbecue is sort of, you know, still going in the background. By the time we'd finally finished our food, we looked at the barbecue and it was absolutely perfect at that point for just cooking on at that point. But it just it took so long. Um, so we've given up barbecuing. Uh, I, I don't do it any longer. Um, I'm trying to remember why I'm saying that story. Oh, yeah. So sometimes it takes a while to get the thing going. You need some patience, Mike says. Um, perseverance. And he says we sometimes need to pray ourselves into prayer, especially in early mornings. Patience to get it going. He says you also need some space in and around the fire so you can uh, allow the heat to build up. Uh, a, um, a fire needs a certain amount of oxygen, doesn't it? And once it, you know, it's got that, it can really get going. Um, I don't know whether they still do it in, in the road I grew up in. We had a, a green, a big grass area. As kids, we used to play football uh, all the time up there and the, or games and, and so on. But once a year, we would um, have a different kind of activity because uh, in October onwards, our, all the neighbours would start to bring on... Uh, bits of wood up and old uh, bits of furniture um, and garden waste, and they would pile up with stuff in the middle of the green. And it grew and grew. This, this, it was a bonfire for a uh, bonfire night on the 5th of November, and it would grow and grow and grow. And it would get up to about 8, 9, 10 feet high. Um, it was a, a, quite a big structure, a loose structure. But as kids, we loved it because we could play in this, this bonfire. And uh, we make dens in there and climb up it. Uh, and we absolutely loved that. And uh, we made sure we were out of it by the time they lit it. But um, on the 5th of November, uh, one or two responsible neighbours would actually light this fire and all the, the neighbours would gather round and uh, bring fireworks and bring their hot drinks and so on. Uh, but there was plenty of space in this, this uh, bonfire to actually burn really well, and it really did get extraordinarily hot. Um, so we need a bit of space in our prayer meetings, uh, a little bit of time when we're actually willing to wait on God, allow space for God to actually speak to us. Um, and some topics might feel they need more time than others. They're, sometimes somebody starts praying something and you, you think, yeah, we just need to stay with that a bit longer. There's that sort of sense of God leading you to uh, stay in that place for a little bit longer. And prayer meetings can be very loud. I've been in some very loud prayer meetings. If you've been in a, in a Pentecostal circles at all, sometimes those sort of settings get very loud. Um, sometimes uh, prayer can be very quiet. And again, going back to Elijah, you'll recall that he met with God in a, a very quiet moment in 1 Kings 19. God said to him there, go out and stand on the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by and a great and strong wind tore the mountains and broke in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, the sound of a low whisper. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. 
And behold, there came a voice to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? And then God goes on to tell him what his next step should be. And it was in that, that whisper, in that very quiet moment, that God really spoke to him. And prayer meetings sometimes go very, very quiet, but it's full silence. It's that sort of be still and know that I am God type of uh, moment, as it says in Psalm 46.10. So prayer goes through all sorts of different phases in prayer meetings, all sorts of different ways that in which we pray and hear God. And Mike says in his book, points out that fire isn't tidy either. And some contributions might feel a bit off key. You know, I've been in prayer meetings where somebody's prayed something and you think, oh gosh, that's very strange and it's sort of jolted. We've, we've been going this direction and suddenly somebody, somebody's come in and moved it in a very different way. Well, we're not supposed to be doing a kind of slick production like a West End show, uh, it's a prayer meeting. And I think sometimes we can be worried, a little bit nervous about, you know, if I pray out, will I get my words muddled up? Will I start praying? Will my theology go a little bit off? Uh, will, I, will I pray a heresy by mistake? You know, it's that, that kind of concern. I think when you're new to prayer and prayer meetings, you know, sometimes you can feel a little bit nervous about speaking out. I guess I would suggest just... Speak out a really short sentence first of all so you don't get into something and think, goodness me, where am I going with this? Um, And uh, you won't be so nervous about uh, making a mistake. But I think God loves to see our passion. He wants to know what's in our hearts. And you know, a short prayer, which is one sentence uh, prayed with enthusiasm to God is better than trying to do a longer prayer, which we, you know, goes all over the place. So, and sometimes we run out of words, don't we, if we're honest? We we just don't know how to pray. I think sometimes there are moments where we genuinely don't know whether this would be the best outcome or whether this would be the best outcome, and we're just lost to know exactly how to pray about something. Uh, Kathy and I have a friend, and she, she says when she gets to that point, she just prays in tongues because she knows that God knows the best outcome. And so this gift of tongues and speaking in tongues, which was given to these disciples on the day of Pentecost, is so, so helpful for us as believers to uh, just to pray uh, occasionally without our minds. Paul, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 14, I will pray with my spirit, but I will pray with my mind also. So sometimes he's, he's using words he understands, but sometimes he's praying in a language he doesn't understand. And again in Romans 8, 26, he says that the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought. The Spirit is there with us, alongside us, to help us in those moments. And so uh, when we pray together, when we uh, come with, together with other people, we can learn so much from others that already know how to pray. Uh, Mike says people learn how to pray and care about the things God cares about by being in prayer meetings. And so I just want to encourage us, I guess, to just keep growing in this area of prayer. It's not easy. Uh, my old pastor in the church in Wimbledon said, you know, sometimes prayer means just like digging a, a hole, you know, digging a, a, in the ground, <laughs> a big hole in the ground. It's just hard work. Uh, but when God comes amongst us when we pray together and it sparks, uh, you know, it, it can be a very exciting kind of dynamic. Uh, there was a few few prayer meetings Tuesday morning a few, few weeks ago when Thule was leading and you know I think she got a, an agenda she knew where she was want, wanting to go but it seemed like God took over the agenda and, and there are moments like that which are very exciting but there are also many moments where it's just hard work and we just need to accept that and get into it and pray knowing that God is faithful and that he is hearing our prayer and he is with us. So I want to encourage us to be continually filled with the Holy Spirit or if you've never experienced the power of the Holy Spirit, to really seek for that. Uh, I became a Christian when I was uh, 18. Um, I was, it was just at the end of the summer before I went to university, or uh, it was polytechnic in those days. It doesn't sound too posh. But uh, I I went to polytechnic, met some other believers, uh, great folks who were part of the Christian Union, learned so much from them and started going to a local church in Wimbledon, which was a very charismatic congregational church, actually, um, and uh, began to hear about the Holy Spirit. So I would really had a, a great experience of coming to know the Lord. Uh, over a two-week period, my, my life transformed from sort of chugging along at that sort of level to really 
just living at a very different level, uh, just knew that God was real, and it was a, began that personal relationship with God at that point, and then went to university and met with these people and heard about the Holy Spirit, uh, started to read books about the Holy Spirit, and I guess about six months after I'd become a Christian, I thought, you know, I really want to know more about uh, this speaking in tongues, prophecy, these spiritual gifts I keep hearing about. And I read lots of books, and I prayed, I think, for about a six-week period. I was praying, God, fill me with the Holy Spirit. Uh, give me this gift of tongues. I want to know the power of the Holy Spirit. And uh, it was on Pentecost Sunday, Whit Sunday, that year, uh, when I was uh, yeah, still 18, I think, uh, maybe 19, that sort of age. And uh, I went along to a church in Wimbledon. Uh, the pastor preached on the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And uh, he made an appeal at the end. Just come forward if you want to be prayed for. And uh, I thought, man, everybody's going to want to go forward for prayer. Uh, and I went forwards, and I was the only one. And uh, I realized that everybody else in the room had experienced the power of the Holy Spirit. It was a very charismatic church. It wasn't unusual to see people uh, shaking and falling over. And you know, it was a kind of era when they were big into dancing and tambourines. Uh, praise God that tambourines are no longer with us. But, uh, but it was uh, a very vibrant, exciting time. But these people had experienced the power of God. So I went forward to the front, uh, and two of the elders prayed for me. And I, as soon as they started praying, I felt the power of God come on me. And I was, I was pushed back. Not, their hands were resting on my, my forehead, but they weren't pushing me. I was, there was something else that was just on me. And uh, I, I thought, I'd better not fall over because the row of chairs behind me, I was, if I fall over, I'm going to smash my head on the chairs. So I was pushing back, trying to stay upright, but I knew that God was, was on me. And uh, about a week later, I started to speak in another language, very, very fast, this language was coming out. And, uh, and that was the gift of tongues. At first, I thought, am I making this up? You know, is this, this is weird. But uh, I believe that God was really... Uh, speaking through me and just allowing the Holy Spirit to speak through me and uh, continue to grow in that gift. Uh, but that was my experience. And if you've never experienced the power of God in that kind of way, uh, I'm not saying that everybody necessarily has to speak in tongues. Not everybody does. But we all can experience the power of God. As Peter promised, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. Uh, and that promise is for us as one of those generations which was way into the future when he said that. So I just want to ask you to um, just continue to press into God, continue to be filled with the Spirit. Uh, if you've not experienced that, then to seek God seriously for that. We're going to uh, come back. Uh, I think Alice is going to lead us in a worship song. Uh, and as we do that, let's say, if you've never been, you know, or haven't prayed for God to fill you for a long time with the Spirit of God, let's, let's press in again to do that now. Let's pray as uh, we start the, the worship. Let's uh, just do that first. Heavenly Father, thank you for that promise that Peter made on the day of Pentecost, later in that chapter of Acts, chapter 2, that this promise of the Holy Spirit is for all of us, for their generation, for the next generation, for all generations. Spirit of God, thank you that even this morning, as we've been worshipping earlier, we've sensed there's something of your, your spirit upon us as we've worshipped. Lord, I want to pray for all of us in this room that we would know the power of God in various ways uh, over these coming days and weeks and months and years. Lord, we want to be a people of the Spirit. We want to be people of the Word. We want to be people who are able to pray effectively because we know the power of God in our lives. And so, Lord, we say, Spirit of God, will you come upon us, rest upon us in a new way, and where we need to be just stirred up again to seek you again for the power of the Spirit, will you do that in our hearts? Amen. <clears throat>